speaker uh, today will be Katrina Horgan. Katrina will give some guidance or assistance or advice in relation to completing your CAO form. We'll then hear from our business humanities, art, music areas, then from our engineering, science, maritime and architecture areas uh, subsequently. So, Katrina, when you're ready to go, uh, away with you. Great. So um, the first thing to say is you're all in a really, um, you know, important space now for making decisions. And we want this session to be really um, meaningful and relevant for you. So to say welcome, to say that we know you're in that space that's um, all about making decisions and we want to help you in the best way we can. If it is um, MTU that you choose, we look forward to working with you. So in this uh, short presentation, I just want to cover very quick orientation of the CAO website, some of the really important and useful tabs, some quick points on considerations that you need to take into consideration when you're choosing your courses, the really important sentence that you've heard many times already, I'm sure, the genuine order of preference, a little bit about the key dates, and then um, a, a little point about the, the level seven and how it can become a gateway to level eight and um, highlight some of the restricted courses and then top tips. So I'm gonna hit straight in there uh, with the next slide. So you'll see here uh, across the top, this is what the CAO website looks like. And the um, tabs across the top there, the one I really want to draw your attention to is the purple one, courses. So, um, you know, when you go in there into courses, you will then choose the MTU. It's actually still listed as CIT on, on the CAO uh, website. And you will go in there and you'll be able to see all of the level eight and all of the level seven courses that are relating to this particular institute. Go, go ahead. So here I just want to highlight there, not all of the courses are listed there, but there is a sample of them. So I want to highlight there for you. You can see the code down at the side and you can see this important word restricted. So when you look at some of the courses there, the Cork School of Music courses, for example, and um, the arts and um, Crawford art and um, some of those courses, all of those ones that I mentioned as restricted, they all have, you know, an interview, an audition or um, a portfolio to prepare in relation to those applications. And so the application date for those is fixed at the 1st of February um, and there is no late application date after that. So it's very important that you note if, if your course is a restricted one. Um, and if you look just there at the little eye information icon there on, for example, the applied art one, um, there's some very useful tips there around, um, you know, steps for your portfolio. So they're important supports there. And on we go. And um, now, Looking there at the list of level seven courses, I just wanted to highlight there the little icon um, on the social care work one there. And that icon is about Garda vetting requirement. There's one of the agricultural courses, for example, that has information about um, different um, uh, locations for the course. So those little information icons are important to look at. Now, this slide is showing you that when you go into a particular slide on, when you go into a particular course of level eight or level seven, if you click on, it'll bring you deeper then to the actual MTU website. Now, we really recommend that you look carefully in detail at the course that you're expressing interest in. So you'll see there circled modules and career. So that information will give you more detail about exactly what's involved in the modules, what's covered in each year, what might be the stepping off points and um, you know career options coming out of those courses. If you are feeling um, in any way unsure about career ideas, have a look at careersportal.ie for researching different careers as well. Um, the, I suppose the thing to say here is that 
there really should not be a course on your list. When you look at your form, there shouldn't be a course on your form anywhere that you haven't done some deep reading on that you know what the course involves and um, you know where it's heading towards. Now, um, you will need to look at the minimum entry requirements for your course. Uh, that's that's a basic that you need to know. What are the minimum entry requirements for the course? Then what's a really useful tab to go into is the CAO points requirements entry for last year. So you'll see on the website, on the CAO website, you can go in there and look at the points that were last year and the year before, and you can see if the points are rising or staying the same or whatever. And it gives you a strong indication then of the CAO points that you're striving for to reach that course. You need to check, is there any specific second level subjects that I need to have covered in order to study in this course? And as I said before, you need to look at the additional submissions and um, if there's any additional entry requirements under that restricted, for example. Now, here you can see the menu down the, the left hand side, the CAO menu. And the one I want to highlight there for you is the student resources tab. The CAO website is very comprehensive, very helpful. Um, and if you go in there, you'll see a demo slide and you'll see an example form. Of course, it's really clear and very important to say that if you do do the practice example form, it's not an actual submission. Um, so just bear that in mind. And also that you will see there the points by year. You'll also see the important dates tab really important to go in there and make sure that you're on top of your dates and um, in terms of any change of mind or anything like that and um, and then the there and here uh, information is there and the mature applications information is there now here is an example of um how in mtu a level seven can lead to a level eight in some cases. And here's just some examples. Now, the point to make here is that point about genuine order of preference. So you could find yourself in a position where um, you're offered a level eight when in actual fact, your preference might have been a level seven. So this is why it's important to think of your genuine order of preference. Now, one of the real advantages here um, with CIT, with MTU is, for example, this common entry business. So so the level seven common entry business can lead on to the Bachelor of Business Honours or the Bachelor of Business, Business Honours in Marketing or the Bachelor of Business Honours in Accounting. So you could enter in level seven and then progress to level eight. In the same way, if you look at the physical sciences common entry level seven, that can lead on then to the honours in applied physics and instrumentation or honours in instrument engineering or honours in analytical chemistry and quality assurance. And again, just to mention the biomedical engineering level seven, if you look, for example, at the points for the level eight biomedical uh, engineering, you may be concerned that in case you may not make those points, you can then go and, and make sure that the level seven is also on your list. And then in your final year of level seven, you have the option then to join year three of the level eight. And so you get to the end space that you were intending to go, but it's an alternative choice route. It is an extra year, but it does take you to the level eight in the end result. And the other thing I just want to say about level eight there is that if you are a student who's looking forward to, um, you know, uh, master's studies at a later point, just bear in mind that most master's applications require a level eight. And now just a couple of slides on some top tips to reiterate some of the important points. So for preparing, allow yourself enough time to get the form done well. You know, it takes time, it takes thinking, don't leave yourself on the very last minute give yourself time the cao website is very very um supportive and uh, comprehensive just give yourself the time and step by step you'll get through it 
do request a conversation with your guidance counsellor if you have any doubts whatsoever or need any clarity on your choices or your information for your form. Your guidance counsellor is there to support you. Consider your preferences. This is an important thing to say, is that in all of the, I suppose, um, pressure of making choices, bear in mind that if you choose an area of study that aligns most closely with your strengths and interests, you are more likely to be successful and fulfilled and to move in the direction of a, you know, a fulfilling career. So do bear in mind your strengths and your preferences when you're making your choices and don't just get caught up on, you know, location and um, points, status, you know, any of those uh, points. Um, do align yourself to your own preferences. Now, um, I, I mentioned this, research the course more deeply on the college website, not just the description, but also go in and look at the modules. Be prepared um, to notice the restricted courses and be sure to put your genuine preferences in your sevens and your eights. Um, then for preparing, this is an interesting one, just check and double check the detail for accuracy, including your contact information. So a lot of time can go into choosing your courses and then maybe a tiny mistake in your address or email or telephone number. So make sure to double check all of your detail for accuracy. Um, use the CIO website, use that left hand uh, student resources um, tab there on the left, use the demo videos, um, Go into that purple tab in the courses and make sure and consider all your level eights and your level sevens. On we go. Um, now, in for the process of filling up the form, just two more slides here now. Um, for the process of filling up your form, be sure to put, I'm saying it over and over, be sure to put your genuine preferences first. Include level sevens as well as level eights and fill in all the choices. You won't have a choice to make until you're actually offered something, but if it's not on the form, it won't be there for you. So get in all your level sevens and all your level eights. Now, watch for your communications from CAO. So when you're filling up your website or when you're filling up your application form, be sure to tick the boxes that allow access to your email and your mobile phone number so that you're receiving emails and texts and keeping an eye on your communications. Um, I, we have speakers later from here and there, um, but just to bear in mind in the form filling to click the box that allows CAO to share your information. And I think we're coming on to the last slide. Um, use your careers guidance counselor. Do not make your decisions based on points alone or on levels. Focus on your area of interest. Research the Institute's website, genuine order of interest. Um, consider level seven as an important gateway to level eight so that you allow yourself as many options and routes as possible to get to where you want to go. Bear in mind your restricted courses um, application date is the 1st of Feb and there is no um, follow up after that. It's the 1st of Feb is the date and that right now it's not too late to apply through here and there. So if there are, um, if you feel that you might be eligible in those spaces, be sure to get the information that you need and start gathering your documents. And I think that might be it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Katrina. Some really fantastic information and uh, guidance there for students. Um, uh, I absolutely uh, support your advice to fill in the uh, two lists completely. I know I live in East Cork here myself and uh, every August I get a queue of kids coming to the front door, queue of students who have not filled out the lists completely, who don't get the courses that they hope to get. They're left without choices on the CAO and uh, as a consequence, they're asking, what can we do? At that stage, we can't do anything. What we can do is give you the right advice now, which is to fill out those lists completely. I see uh, a lot of points being raised on the chat, uh, specific points coming up there in relation to the number of places that we have uh, in, uh, in particular courses, uh, questions in relation to uh, CAO points. If somebody doesn't get their first choice, do they get the same chance with their second choice? 
that some, that might match somebody else's first choice? And the answer is absolutely yes. The system will consider you totally on the basis of your points. Um, there's specific questions there on sports uh, and uh, sports recreation, recreation leisure management. That area we we will uh, answer that. There's a question there in relation to the criteria to get from level seven to level eight. We will uh, get that addressed in due course. So, Katrina, we we'll leave you at this point. Thanks for your contribution. Um, you, you might take a look at the chat yourself, Katrina. If there's any questions you can address there, it'll be great if you can. Okay, thank we'll you. Now to the uh, Faculty of Business and Humanities, which includes Crawford College of Art and Design and DMTU Cork School of Music. We have a, a presentation uh, from the head of faculty, uh, Mr. Gerard O'Donovan, which uh, we will... Uh, uh, um, present now and shortly thereafter we will start getting into the questions that have been raised in advance and that are coming in live in relation to courses in the uh, faculty of business and humanities as soon as you can run it there uh, philip away you go good afternoon hope you're all keeping well delighted to be here to share information about our ceo programs currently available from mtu cork school of music mtu crawford college of art and design MTU School of Humanities and MTU School of Business. The following CEO programs are offered at MTU Cork School of Music. A Bachelor of Music, a BA in Theatre and Drama Studies, a BA in Popular Music and a BA in Musical Theatre. The Honours Bachelor of Music degree is a four-year program suitable for students who are interested in studying in the areas of classical music, jazz or Irish traditional music. Students receive weekly one-to-one -one lessons with in-house professional staff. Aspiring instrumental and classroom teachers can take courses in education and other specialities include conducting, composing and arranging, music therapy and music technology. Graduates have developed careers as professional performers, freelance musicians, ensemble leaders and conductors, instrumental vocal teachers, musicologists, researchers, journalists, and arts administrators. Many students also go on to postgraduate study in performance, education, musicology, or composition. The BA in Theatre and Drama Studies is a four-year program that centers on theatre performance training with supporting modules to facilitate wider career options. The program aims to produce artists that have a diverse theatre-based skill set, which will give them a strong foundation for a career in theatre, either as a performer or in theatre production. Graduates have developed careers in theater, film, TV and radio performance, stage management, stage lighting and sound, production, direction, costuming, stage design, and more. The BA in Popular Music is a modern four-year level eight music degree that provides comprehensive training in contemporary commercial music. There is now only one CEO code for this course, where there were previously different CEO codes for the various instruments. CR125 is a CEO code that all students should now use. Students receive a weekly one-to-one -one lesson in their chosen area. This could be drums, bass, keyboard, piano, guitar, or voice. Music technology is a core subject for the first three years of the BA in popular music with elective options available in year four. Graduates have gone on into commercial music industry as performers, writers, recording artists, producers, sound technicians, teachers, and administrators strongly equipped to further develop their own entrepreneurship and freelance employment opportunities. Our newest degree course in the Cork School of Music is the BA in Musical Theatre, CR 130. Students that choose to join the new BA in Musical Theatre course will receive intensive training in three main areas throughout their four years of study, singing, acting, and dancing. Weekly individual one-to-one -one singing lessons for musical theatre are supplemented by vocal ensemble, uh, dance and musical theatre ensemble classes. The MTU Cork School of Music is a 12,000 square foot purpose-built facility with 54 practice studios, a large fleet of Steinway Grand Pianos, a 385 seat performance hall, a 120 seat black box theatre, state-of-the-art professional recording studio, music library, dance studios, classrooms, lecture theatres and in-house cafe. It's the perfect home for your studies.
Based on Sharma Crawford Street, the BA courses in Contemporary Applied Art and Fine Art equip students with a range of specialist skills and knowledge, preparing them for a wide variety of careers in the creative cultural sectors. The focus on the development of each individual student's creative potential and graduates go on to become practicing artists, teachers, art therapists, curators, designers, and many other kinds of creative practitioner. Graduates also take the strong transferable skills that come from studying in this unique way into work into other spheres. The difference between the two courses is that students in contemporary applied art are focused to a great extent on materials and making skills, either specializing in ceramics, glass or textiles, or working across a combination of these materials. Students on the creative digital media and visual communication courses are based in Bishopstown on the main campus and those on the Photography with New Media course occupy newly established, well-equipped facilities in the Envision Centre located just off Sullivan's Quay in the city centre. These three courses prepare students for careers in the design and media industries as photographers, film and video producers, art directors, animators, graphic designers, illustrators, web and user interface designers, multimedia producers, and a host of other occupations that draw on their highly developed creative, teamwork, lateral thinking and communication skills, along with their advanced technical skills. This year, we will be asking applicants to submit a digital portfolio. If you visit the website, you'll find detailed information on the apply page to help you with compiling and submitting a digital portfolio. We will now allocate places on these courses based solely on the portfolio score, rather than on leaving certificate points. Applicants must have H5 in two subjects and O6 H7 in four other subjects. The six subjects must include English or Irish. Here are a number of CEO programmes offered by the Department of Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies. CR440, B.Ed. Honours in Montessori Education, offers an extended period of placement across all four years. CRO32, the B.Buzz in Recreation and Leisure, combines technical skills and competencies with a strong business background. The leisure industry is one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy. CR430, the B-Buzz Honours in Sports and Exercise Management combines sport, exercise and health skills with core business skills to equip graduates to work in the sports, leisure or business sectors. There's comprehensive work placement in year three of the programme. CR620, the BA in Early Childhood Education and Care does full employment after graduation work placements essential and set graduates apart from other theoretical offerings. MTU has made significant investment in new sporting and training facilities, with MTU's new state-of-the-art MTU arena to be completed by September of this year. The following are CAO programmes offered in the Department of Applied Social Studies. CRO 31, a BA in social care work, is for students who want to work in partnership with those who experience marginalization and discrimination or who have special needs. Compulsory 800 hours of work placement on the program across three years. Placements offered in a variety of settings, for example, the homeless sector, disability sector, intellectual disability sector and community sector. CRO 35 Community Development provides an opportunity for students active in the community to achieve formal qualifications and community work hands-on course with placement in a community-based organisation. The university can boast about having the finest tourism and hospitality education facilities in the country, with two production kitchens, five specialist kitchens, two restaurants and a training bar, front office reception room, general classrooms and lecture theatres, as well as information technology laboratories and a complete range of administration and support facilities. CRO42 B Buzz in Hospitality Management is a strong emphasis on broad business with expertise and knowledge needed to become a successful manager or entrepreneur. CRO41 and CR660 programs in tourism management, there are opportunities to work in a large variety of settings, both nationally and internationally. Learning takes place during field trips, lab work, guest lectures, together with class-based activities. CR640, the B Buzz in Culinary Arts, does mandatory work placements with an opportunity to work with an experienced workplace mentor. Why study business at MTU? You will graduate with a set of transferable skills essential for business. 
All of our programs are developed in partnership with enterprise and the professions and incorporate a mandatory work placement component. Key focus on engagement with the business community through the integration of award-winning authentic assessment approaches in our teaching and learning. Our programs are accredited by the professional bodies and our graduates enjoy unsurpassed exemptions from the professional examinations of the key professional associations. Access to an award-winning entrepreneurship education ecosystem where students can develop their entrepreneurial and creative skills as part of their curriculum. Opportunity to build international networks and experience through a growing and diverse number of international students at MTU are through international educational exchange, work placement or study abroad programs. MTU business graduates go on to work in many different sectors. Careers with business degrees include roles in accounting and finance departments. Other sectors with high demand for business graduates include marketing and digital marketing, IT, human resources and supply chain management. The following level eight programs are offered in the School of Business with specialisms in accounting, business information systems, marketing and international business with languages. We also have a number of level seven offerings specializing in business administration, agriculture and our common entry program in business. All these offer a pathway to a level eight honors award. We take in approximately 200 students annually to our common entry business program CRO21. This allows students to experience a number of different modules and after year two, they can decide to specialize in business, accounting or marketing. All degree pathways lead to a level eight honors business degree. Students pursuing the general business and marketing options obtain a level seven business degree and may progress in year four to complete the aligned honors level eight degree. Students pursuing accounting join the honors level eight degree for years three and four. Work placement is an integral part of all programs in the School of Business, with students working in an organization for a minimum of 15 weeks during their program. A large number of students are offered jobs from these organizations after graduation. Here is a sample of some of the organizations taking our business students on work placement. Finally, I want to thank you all for listening and my team and I are happy to answer any questions you might have in relation to our CEO programs. MTU has state-of-the-art facilities, a dedicated staff, is student-centered and can guarantee you a memorable university experience. We will equip you with the knowledge, skills and competencies to get a job, start your own business or ensure you can pursue further study. Make sure an MTU program is your first preference CEO choice. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerard. Really comprehensive uh, presentation there. I'm looking at some of the questions uh, coming in live. I see we've uh, five open questions, 18 that have been addressed. We have uh, an attendee that's interested in studying commerce in UCC and wants to know what would be the equivalent course in MTU. Yeah, go for it, so Trudy. Um, so yeah, we have the equivalent Bachelor of Business uh, degree, common entry, and the option to qualify um, with a business honours degree. So um, you qualify, you have the option of qualifying with a general business degree, um, specialising in accounting or specialising in marketing. So there is the four-year honours business degree, and you enter it through the business common entry uh, pathway. Thank you very much, Trudy. That's great. Thank you. Um, the next question we have here is aimed at uh, the contemporary applied arts. And it's a question in relation to the nature of the personal statement that's required and if there are any scholarship opportunities. And we have somebody to take that question. Yes, um, Michael, I'll take that question. So, uh, it was, can you tell me which program they were asking about, Michael, again there? Uh, contemporary Applied Arts is what's listed here. So the Contemporary Applied Art program is a program that is um, very much an artist maker course with specific interest in ceramic glass textiles. It's a, it's in the art and design sector. We don't have any scholarships, but you can apply for SUSE, SUSE grants applicable. Was there two parts to that question, Michael? Sorry, I just entered at the same time. Uh, the other one was in relation to the personal statement, Trish. Is there a I think the personal statement refers to the mature students 
personal statement. We don't have a requirement. It's a portfolio. And, um, and I could say that, you know, if the person has particular questions, they can email me at trish.brennan at cit.ie, T-R-I-S-H dot B-R-E-N-N-A-N at cit.ie. The personal statement, I think, must relate to a, a mature student application. Yeah, indeed. It mentions year two, so it's a mature student. Without a and the deadline for the mature students for the advanced entry is through the CAO and the deadline is the 1st of May. So they have plenty of time. Thank you, Trish. Um, the, the next question is a question. It's a business question. So and, and it's related to, to business courses. And how can applicants figure out how to choose one business course rather than another? Uh, so, Trudy, are you coming in for that one? Yeah, I can take that again, Michael. So our business degree actually offers lots of flexibility to students if they're not sure yet which pathway they want to take. So in the first two years of the business common entry degree, students take all nature of business modules ranging from economics to marketing, management, human resource management, IT, maths, etc. So all students will participate in a general business degree for the first two years. Students then can choose at the end of second year in what area they want to specialize in. So they can specialize in accounting, should they be interested in going down the accounting and finance route. They can specialize in marketing, if they're interested in going down the route of marketing, advertising, PR, et cetera. Or they can specialize in the general business degree route, which allows them to enter um, areas such as logistics, supply chain, management, entrepreneurship, and of course, accounting and finance as well. So the first two years of our business degree actually gives students options to examine all areas of business and so that they can figure out what they enjoy and what area they want to then specialize in. So in effect, uh, Trudy, it's along the lines of the advice that Katrina gave at the beginning, to the best of your ability, figure out what your interests are and then, uh, and then you have the opportunity to follow those interests uh, based on what modules you choose and what choices you make in terms of specialising as, as you go through the course. Absolutely. Very good. Um, the next question that's coming through is in relation to sport and exercise. Uh, um, well, it's not sport. Let me see. It's been, that one actually has been uh, addressed. So uh, what, what requirements do I need for sports courses if I'm coming from a PLC course? Uh, do we have anybody to take that question at the moment? Yeah, Michael, I can come in there. Um, it's the same entry qualifications for everybody, really, for the sports and exercise programme, and they're laid out there on our website. All of the um, entry requirements are on the website there. So if you want to go on, have a look at those. The PLC isn't very different from anything else, really. OK, so so again, the standard standard entry requirements yeah. there, Margaret, but yeah. just in, in relation to that. Yeah. Um, a, a related job what or a question what jobs could you exactly get with a sports and exercise management degree well there's a lot of um jobs i think our graduates have a lot of uh, employment opportunities really the leisure centers obviously is a very obvious one as well and um, there's plenty of demand for personal trainers at the moment for example there is um you know they work they don't even always stay in the sports and leisure Field, they can branch off from that as well. So the obvious ones obviously would be the leisure center, the personal training, and um, there's lots more as well. We have graduates employed in a lot of other areas that aren't directly related to sports as well, because it's a very good degree to have. So the, so the business aspect, uh, Margaret, gives yeah. flexibility for it people does. if they want yeah. to either stay in the sports domain or the general thing as well, set up their own business, Michael, is another thing as well with the business. A lot of people set up their own business as well from this degree as well. So that's another option as well. Having the business background there is good. Thank you, Margaret. Um, uh, the next question relates to accounting, marketing and business. And, and the question is, how many hours a week of lecturing and tutorials are there for each of these courses? So the specific courses are CR 400, CR 420, and CR021. Um, I'm happy to respond to that question, Michael. Uh, Thank so you for your Department of Marketing and International Business here at CIT. And for most business programs in year one, you're typically talking about 20 hours of contact time uh, with lecturers. So that'll be a variety of lecturers and labs in smaller groups and on occasions tutorials. Um, we normally spread classes over about four and a half days of the week. Normally we try to get people wrapped up and out for the weekend by one o'clock on a Friday in normal times. 
uh, but that's your typical workload. It increases as in terms of your the workload you need to do outside of that sometimes as you proceed through the semester in terms of contact time. That's the basic. And, and, and does it change then uh, through subsequent years of the course, Pio? Uh, it's typically around that level. So it might go closer to maybe 18 hours in years three and four, um, but it's normally in or around the 20, give or take an hour or two. Thank you very much, Pio. Next question we have relates to music, and it's a question around the audition standard that's, expect, that's expected. So I guess the, <clears throat> the question is, does somebody from a music point of view or who's uh, applying for a music course already need to be, uh, have, have a very high level of proficiency in music? Do we have somebody to take that question? Hi, Michael, I can take that one. Thank you very much. Um, so, with regard to music, it depends on the course that you're going into uh, for the Bachelor of Music program. Um, we don't expect you to have completed any grade examinations, which would be kind of popular thing for a lot of classical musicians, but perhaps not traditional Irish musicians or um, jazz players. Um, we would like you to do the audition um, come to meet us uh, and we can decide whether you're at a high enough standard to be successful in the course. That's what's most important to us is that, are you going to enjoy the course? Are you going to be able to succeed in the course? And we can talk to you and see if you have the potential to join the course. A similar, um, it's very similar for the BA in popular music as well, very similar that we would like to meet you. Uh, we would like to hear you play or hear your singing and chat with you about what your career aspirations are and see if you'd be a good fit for the course. So, mo so, so motivation is very important here. Very important, absolutely, yes. Okay, yep. thanks very much. Um, the next question we have relates to early childhood education and care. Do any of the courses offer study abroad? Yes, we have had very good placements abroad. We have a number of different agreements with uh, universities in Germany, for example, and uh, we would like to keep that up as well. Obviously not at the moment, but when we get back to normal times again, there are opportunities to go abroad. We've had very successful semesters and placements abroad on this programme, Michael. Yeah, okay, so we'll stay with the, the social care work and I suppose it does a more general question here. What care or youth courses are available at MTU? So maybe a care, care for younger people. Uh, yeah. I we have different modules. We have different youth modules in the BA in social care work. And there's also some youth work modules in the community development program. So we have a whole youth program, but there are modules within those two programs that accommodate those youth um, studies. Okay, the next question relates to hospitality management. And the question is, uh, what are the progression options? So if somebody wants, uh, enters a level seven, are there opportunities to go on and complete level eight? Hi, Michael. Yes, thanks. I'll take that question. Yes. So on, on all of our programs within the departments, uh, if you enter a level seven offering, you can um, progress to a level eight. So many of our students after their placement in year three uh, will go on to complete their honours degree, which is a great capstone piece uh, after completing a, a, a lengthy placement uh, to finish out their level eight degree. Uh, thank you, Noel. The next uh, question relates to business information systems, BIS. And, and the question really is to say, well, what are the, the similar alternatives that are available to BIS? So if somebody's interested in BIS, what other programs or courses should they be thinking about that are similar in nature to give them the best chance of pursuing a career in that area? Um, I'm happy to take that. Thank you. Um, so really, I guess what you're looking at are programs with similar themes in terms of IT and business. Business administration would be a fairly popular program that uh, would be seen as an alternative to business information systems. Um, and you could also take a look at the business studies programs as well as an alternative. Okay, thanks indeed. Um, we're going back to the sport and exercise management and the question uh, relates to when people uh, progress on to uh, level eight courses here is a good knowledge of business expected or essential so i suppose really the question is what's the balance between the uh, knowledge of business and knowledge of sports knowledge of sports science and how important is is um knowledge of business when students are considering which courses they're going to follow on to. Well, our sports programs obviously have a very, very practical base, Michael. We have a lot of physical activity and there's a lot of practical uh, in the sports primarily. It's 
activities, it's sports based, but um, a knowledge of business is of course important, but we have electives as well, so you can choose different subjects within that program as well, but it's primarily activities and physical activity rather than business. Okay, thank you, Margaret. I'm just scrolling down here now, trying to pick up another question or two. Uh, this, uh, the next one is in relation to agriculture. Well, agricultural science, we'll come back to that when we get to the business or to the engineering and science um, areas. Is there any recommendation for what pieces to use for the visual communications portfolio? So in relation to the visual communications portfolio, um, anybody want to, to provide some guidance in relation to that? I can come in there, Michael. Um, I'm going to say that there's been a huge amount of work done on uh, visual um, portfolios this year in the background. So I would recommend that um, applicants, interested applicants, check out the Crawford College particular website. So that's crawford.cit.ie. On the top banner, there is a whole how to apply. How to, and also, if you check our Facebook page, um, that where there are links from the website, there is a, um, a video on how to prepare your portfolio, what to include. There's numerous handy hit, handy tips. I'm going to give my name again. It's trish.brennan at cit.ie. Please, if you're struggling with anything there, I will send you to the direct, the direct links. But crawford.cit.ie, on the top, there's a banner, there's a, a tab to how to apply, and there's endless information there. And it's all really super, super easy to follow. Uh, thank you, Trish. I'll just hold you for one more question. Uh, Absolutely. Who chooses CR210, Contemporary Applied uh, Art? Uh, will they have to choose a specialization of either ceramic, glass, or textiles, or can they continue on their studies with all three materials? We would absolutely encourage an exploration of all three and they, the way the course is structured is people get to work with all that materiality in year one and two. They can specialise in year three and four, but they also have the their scope for students to keep embracing a multiplicity of um, mediums. So it very, very much student centred on choice. OK, thank you, Trish. The next question is in relation to CR121. The uh, music honours uh, degree, the focus of the student is going to be on the performance side of things. And to date, they've had very little experience with the technological side of things. Will the student be at a disadvantage on the course? Hi, Michael, it's Kira here again. I'll, I'll jump in there and, and answer that one. Uh, Thank you, Kira. So, no, you won't, absolutely won't be at a disadvantage. We don't expect you to have any music technology experience. Um, if, you're, if your focus up until now has been in performance, um, in year one, you will have music technology electives. And I suppose the purpose of those is to make sure that you become comfortable using music notation software and um, being able to record yourself um, for examinations or for school projects, things like that. Um, but it's at a very basic level and they start from the very beginning. So you don't need to worry if your specialty has been in performance up until now, um, we will, we will uh, get you caught up on the music technology side of things. Many thanks, Kira. Thank you. Next question, CR400 accounting. Uh, can you give us some examples of where students have completed their work experience? <laughs> Have we got somebody to, to address that? I think we have a sound issue, sound issue there, so I'll, I'll move on to Business Information Systems, CR150. Uh, how how is the uh, the business and IT content divided up? Is it fifty fifty? Is it more business? Is it more IT? Um, I am happy to answer that again. And to confirm, it is fifty fifty in terms of business and technology. And there's a lot of integration of the technology subjects with the business subjects, which is kind of reflective of what's happening in industry in the in in, in technology. Okay. Uh, a question in relation to CR420, Marketing Honours. What's the difference between studying marketing at level eight as opposed to true business at level seven? Okay, um, that's a good question uh, and one that's relevant for a number of areas, including accounting as well. 
So largely what we try to do is we encourage people who are a little bit less certain about what area of business they want to study to take CRO21. Whereas those that are fairly sure that they want to do marketing or have a good sense that that's the type of thing that might uh, work for them, we encourage them to do the level eight program. At the end of four years in both cases, you're gonna have similar outcomes. Um, you're expected at that stage to be a, a strong marketer with, with very good digital skills and with very strong interpersonal skills. The journey along the way is a little bit different. So by taking CR021, the common entry program, um, you've got a little bit more flexibility to sample other areas as you're so doing. Um, however, you do lose out on, on a few areas of specialism that aren't available on that program. So by doing the level A program, you get the opportunity to immerse yourself fairly fully in areas related to marketing, business development and sales uh, throughout it. In both cases, you have the opportunity to undertake placement in a marketing context. Um, so it's, it's hard to go too far wrong with either one if you're interested in marketing. Uh, thank you, Pio. You might stay on the line there, Pio. We have a question in relation to international business with language honours, CR425. What are the languages on offer while studying this course? Very good. So this is a timely question. Again, languages remain important. And from an Irish economic perspective, that they will always be important, uh, particularly post-Brexit as we do more business with Europe. The languages that we concentrate on this program are uh, German, Spanish and French. And in each case, you need to have studied whichever one you want to do uh, at MTU uh, for the Leaving Cert. So, for example, you want to do international business with French, you have to have done French for your Leaving Cert and got a H4 or an O1 in that language. Um, one of the advantages of doing a language is that it does set you a little bit apart afterwards after completing your degree to candidates who do not have a, 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 a European language at that stage. And we're finding feedback from graduates as such that um, it's giving them an advantage as they set off in their careers. Uh, thank you, Pio. The next question relates to CR440 Montessori education and CR620 early childhood education. And the question is, what's the difference between the two? Okay, so the early childhood is a more general degree. It deals with all types of different education. The Montessori is purely Montessori based education. And um, with the Montessori degree, you can work generally Montessori schools, but you can also work in the other play schools. With the early childhood, you can work in throughout all of the uh, play schools, really. And just to reiterate something that Charles said earlier as well, there's full employment for all these graduates. The graduates that are level seven or level eight programs, they're in full employment. So they're a really good course to get into because there's full employment in this area at the moment. Yeah, you might stay with us, uh, Margaret. Uh, social care, what's the difference between a social care worker and a social worker? Okay, so social care worker is um, very varied. Again, you get different um, occupations in lots of different areas that deal with uh, social care, nursing homes, disability sector, all those type of areas. The other type is not, uh, is flexible. It's a more specialized degree that's offered through UCC or it's very generic, it's very hands-on, lots of placement as well. So again, I'm probably more employable in different sectors really. Yeah, so a related question, am I fully qualified to work as a social care worker after successfully completing the three years of study in CR031? Yes, yes. Yes is the answer, thank you. We'll move on to uh, tourism management. Uh, what's the difference between studying tourism management at level eight as opposed to level seven? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, so again, a good question. Um, so students can take it at, as level seven or level eight. Obviously, depending on and there's a different entry requirement and uh, can be a different CAO points entry as well. Um, ideally speaking, the they're pretty similar programs um, over the course of the of the first three years. One of the critical things, though, to to state is that um, students who go on to the four year program, you know, have direct entry for the, the entire degree. Um, if you do the level seven, obviously you, you have the option of completing a, a three year program level seven and then continuing on, which you do need to get uh, particular grades uh, to get into the final year. So, you know, again, the, the big thing from for me would be where a student is in terms of their entry level. Uh, and if they can uh, go to the level eight program directly on CAO, uh, then that's what I would advise. Uh, thank you, Noel. Uh, CR042, specific question coming through on the live chat there in relation to examples of work placement on the hospitality management front. 
And so again, yeah, we've we've had fantastic um, opportunities. Graduates have, or sorry, students have fantastic opportunities in this space. So we have built up a really good um, network of hotels and restaurants throughout uh, the region. Uh, so number of our students will go to places uh, like the, the Europe Hotel in Killarney, for example, or Hayfield Manor here in Cork City, if they want to work in a five star and get that experience. Uh, other students may want to, to work at a four-star uh, offering. So again, we would have loads of hotels that we would deal with in that space. Um, a number of our students also decide uh, to go in their third year um, to go on international placement. So we have a number of contacts in the United States, for example, and in the UK. So students would have gone to um, South Carolina and to places like Florida and Boston as well. So again, we've just experienced this for the last probably 30 years. Uh, and again, lots of our graduates are in the industry. So yeah, we have no problem in placing graduates in, I suppose, in somewhere that they want to be and that suits uh, where they want to learn. Uh, thank you, Noel. I suppose one further question for yourself there, uh, Noel. In relation to COVID, uh, clearly the newspapers are full of headlines in relation to the impact that COVID has had in certain sectors. Uh, historically, it's been the case uh, that, that when Challenges of this nature arise, application levels may fall, but then there can be incredible numbers of job opportunities at the time of graduation. So is it a time for students to come into these courses in expectation of a recovery in due course, or, or how would you advise them to proceed? Yeah, absolutely. And I think if we look back to our, our most recent recession um, at the end of the, the Celtic Tiger era, you know, we saw how quickly when people stopped going to construction courses, for example, um, that now we have a really shortage in that area. Uh, tourism was one of the main sectors that rebounded really quickly, actually, after the last economic downturn. One of the things I would say is that we have a unique tourism product and offering here uh, in Ireland. And even if you look recently, we've had uh, more successes in the whole area of Michelin star restaurants and Bib Gourmands. Um, so that's really only, only coming out this week. So I expect that there will be also huge pent up demand actually for tourism experiences because all of us uh, have been unable to go on holidays for the last year and probably for the next number of months. Um, so I do think there will be, uh, be a real surge uh, for, for tourism experiences and that will mean there'll be more people required in hotels, in restaurants, uh, in tourism attractions, uh, in, in the whole area of tourism hospitality. So I, I agree, uh, Michael, I think actually, although every the industry is in a state of flux at present, I think it will rebound really quickly. Uh, and what's interesting is actually a number of our, our current graduates, albeit they're on leave at the moment, they're only waiting for the industry to start up and they have you know, lots of job opportunities. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Noel. We're seeing some interesting information come through on the polls. We can see that uh, the MTU uh, website is very important uh, to you in terms of being a source of information. And we can see that the guidance counsellors are playing a very important uh, role in engaging and advising our students. We're coming to the end of this uh, segment on the business and humanities side. There are fantastic opportunities in business and humanities in CIT. There's opportunities in, in the business area, start your own business, entrepreneurship. There's opportunities in the creative side, in music and arts. There's fantastic opportunities in the social care side in terms of dealing with people and fulfilling your potential in that uh, regard. And in terms of the tourism and hospitality sector, uh, there are just enormous opportunities. It's not the time not to apply for a tourism and hospitality course. Our advice would be to apply now because the openings will be there uh, in, in time to come. On the international business front, uh, currently, clearly, there are issues to do with travel. Vaccines are coming. The world is going to open up. We would say to you, play the long game. Don't pick a course based on what's happening in the world today. Pick a course based on what you want to do what appeals to you and where you think the world will be in three or four years time. So on that note, we conclude the business and humanities section. I want to sincerely thank uh, all colleagues who've contributed in that regard. And I'll, ask, I'll now ask the head of the Faculty of Engineering and Science, uh, Tim Horgan, to uh, make a presentation in that area. Thanks very much. So just to quickly run through this, uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions at the end. But what I'll do, I'll step through it as quickly as possible, highlighting 
I can't highlight everything because the number of programs we have here, the number of schools and departments is quite extensive. But I will highlight a number on the way through. And at the end, we can loop back and answer any questions that uh, people might have. So to begin with, uh, we're going to look at the School of Science and Informatics uh, with the Department of Biological Sciences, Physical Sciences, Computer Science uh, is missing there, and the Department of Mathematics. In the, um, in the Department of Biological Sciences, we've got a number of programs ranging from Biological Sciences Common Entry to Biomedical Science, Pharmaceutical Biotechnology, Nutrition and Health Science, Agri-Biosciences, and the Level 7 Applied Biosciences program. If I had to pick one, uh, it's very difficult. So I've been asked by the head of the department to pick uh, Agri, to highlight Agri-Biosciences uh, randomly. Agri-Biosciences is a Level 8 program, and it has particular significance in this COVID-19 era and Brexit era, because it deals with production and biosecurity of food produced uh, from the sector. And this is of cr crucial importance to us, to our, our uh, well-being and our economy. The program has developed over the years and uh, there are new thematic areas, uh, and new modules basically in immunology and uh, DNA technologies, environmental impact and bioinformatics, for example. Um, the new modules developed are veterinary diagnostics and uh, quantitative genetics. And this program has a very, very strong partnership with industry and it's got um, uh, many of the uh, companies from Glanbier to Kerry Group to Bandon Vale and others that you'll be familiar with. The, um, the Agri Biosciences program staff are very actively engaged in research and work uh, uh, to uh, develop uh, research with their students at undergraduate and postgraduate level. For example, uh, in the uh, recent times, they've recruited more than 10 uh, postgraduate students in this field and have brought in over 5 million in research funding, which is very significant. There's some examples of the first cohort who graduated in 2020, and they range from uh, students or graduates who moved on to PhDs and master's programs to working in industry in the various companies listed there. And again, very strong uh, industry collaboration with work placement and uh, many more companies listed there. Too many to, uh, to fit in the previous slide. Moving on to uh, the next department in the School of Science and Informatics, and that's the Department of Physical Sciences. And there are a range of programs here, uh, starting with the Physical Sciences uh, to Analytic Chemistry with Quality Assurance, Instrumentation Engineering, Environmental Science and Sustainable Technology, and Physical Sciences at, at Level 7, and the others listed there at Level 7 as well. The uh, one uh, point to note recently that the Intel uh, Scholarship, Women in Technology Scholarship 2021, Dorothy Kane uh, won that scholarship. So again, a great opportunity for women looking to get into a really dynamic area. Uh, there are, by the way, there are some other scholarship, all scholarships available across MTU uh, are available by this webpage, cit.ie scholarship. So you can see a range of scholarships available to incoming students and existing students there. Sticking with the Department of Physical Sciences, there is a joint program in industrial physics with UCC. This is uh, an MTU stroke UCC program where students uh, go to UCC and come to MTU at the same time. Uh, a very exciting program and so is the environmental science and sustainable technology program and uh, I've been asked by the head of the department just to point out that there are strong links with the environmental protection agency and other such bodies. On to the department of computer science. Uh, the department has uh, five programs, three at level eight, uh, from ranging from software development, computer systems to IT management and uh, the, uh, the one I want to focus on is IT management because cybersecurity is an area that's growing rapidly in the uh, Cork uh, and um, Southwest region and beyond. And uh, MTU Cork uh, or CIT uh, has taken a national lead in this area. Uh, recently, Dean Brennan, who's a third year student in IT management, uh, spoke about his experience in uh, MTU and how he made his uh, how he made the decision to 
move into IT management. And as you can see from an article, and I can give you the link, it's from the Irish Independent. He uh, gives one, I think, really sensible piece of advice, not uh, don't worry uh, about it and don't follow the money, just follow your interests. In other words, follow your heart. And I think that's, that's, you know, if you're really interested in this area, he was, he was interested in technology. He was interested in, in cybersecurity. And he's now working in, in his third year placement in, with a cybersecurity company. And there are huge opportunities for uh, Dean and his uh, colleagues in that class and the other classes in this area, plus in software development and in computer systems and other areas as well. I suppose my focus is on cybersecurity. Uh, we recently uh, appointed Dr. Don O'Shea as Chair of Cybersecurity, again showing that MTU Cork is the lead in all Ireland in cybersecurity. So much so that we've taken in 8 million alone in the past year in funding uh, for cybersecurity. So the benefits that students see from the expertise that that, that, that the expertise that's on staff to the equipment to the facilities is second to none. And when I, when I speak about expertise, you know, the staff in the faculty, you won't get better. They're, um, you know, it's, it's, there's so many there, I can't highlight them all, but I've just picked one in the uh, cybersecurity, sorry, in cybersecurity there, Dr. Don O'Shea, and another in the Department of Computer Science, since I'm dealing with that department, is Dr. Mubashar Romani, who's um, uh, listed as within a 1% of researchers in computer science worldwide. So it's a huge achievement from, from Mubashar and his, his colleagues in the Department of Computer Science. Also, the Department of Computer Science is known for its uh, artificial intelligence, not alone its MSc in artificial intelligence, but the AI programs and AI modules that students study as part of the BSc honors in software development and the BSc honors in computer systems. We've recently uh, installed possibly the, the, the largest um, AI uh, supercomputer of its type uh, in the country. Uh, and again, of its type, it's a GPU cluster. It's one of the largest in the country. And it's, uh, it's built by Dell. And it was a joint cooperation between Dell Technologies and uh, MTU Cork. Moving on to uh, another school, this is the School of Mechanical, Electrical and Process Engineering. And you can see we have the Department of Mechanical, Biomedical and Manufacturing Engineering, the Department of Process, Energy and Transport Engineering, and the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. If we take the first one under uh, Professor Joe Kelly, the Department of Mechanical, Biomedical and Manufacturing Engineering, there are four programs, two at level eight, the mechanical engineering program and the, mechanic, and the biomedical uh, engineering program. And you have level seven uh, variations of those programs as well. Jur has asked me to point out the uh, integrated five-year MEng program uh, in mechanical and biomedical engineering. And uh, the, um, the first graduates uh, from this full-time program uh, the MEng program, Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering, will graduate from MTU in 2021. Now, this is a five-year program, and there's progression opportunities uh, allowing um, uh, students to move into this uh, MEng uh, degree. Uh, the, uh, the school has is known for its quality, uh, and this is demonstrated by the achievement of, the stu of students from, from this department alone. If you look at it, uh, the international impact that they've had, not alone in Barcelona, but right across the globe, over into uh, Australia, winning competition after competition. They, these are uh, uh, the best graduates in mechanical and biomedical engineering in the country. And they've also shown that they're the best in the world, achieving you know, uh, really prestigious uh, awards at international competitions and, and competing against the very best. Uh, looking at the Department of Process, Energy and Transport Engineering, programs range from chemical and biopharmaceutical engineering, automotive business management and technology, sustainable energy engineering, and automotive technology and management at level seven. If we look at this, just one sustainable energy program, the highlight uh, and achievement of Jack Murphy this year, achieving first place in the National Student Award uh, competition uh, in 2020. 
Moving to uh, the next department, Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, uh, two uh, types of programs there, one in electrical engineering, the second one in electronic engineering, and we have level seven versions of those programs as well. There is a new development within that department, and there is a new BNG Honours uh, level eight, which is, uh, um, I believe, uh, um, currently being developed. And the hope is that this will be offered uh, as available places in 2021 through the CAO. Now, this means that it's not on the CAO at the moment, will appear towards the end of the year, hopefully if we get this through the approval process. This is a, an innovative program. It's a multidisciplinary program combining different aspects of engineering. What's unique about it, and I'm sure Martin will be able to help us later on this, was for me, what's unique about it is the studio-based approach uh, to problem sol solving uh, that, that it encompasses. So it's really interesting. And uh, the entry requirements are listed there. I can share this slide deck with people afterwards if they, if they wish to see it. Moving on to the School of Building and Civil Engineering. Again, the departments in there are the Civil and Structural and Environmental Engineering, Department of Construction, and the Department of Architecture. In civil structural and environmental engineering, the programs available include structural engineering at level eight and a common entry uh, engineering program as well, and level seven programs in civil engineering and environmental engineering. Uh, again, uh, the head of the department has asked me to uh, point out that the BN genres and structural engineering students can now move into an MNG, a five-year MNG program in structural engineering and also in uh, civil engineering. And also to note that level seven graduates who do progress, who progress to the uh, structural engineering level eight, once they get into to MTU Cork, have that option of progressing to the, uh, to the uh, masters as well. A point, uh, the, the, the last point there is level seven graduates across architecture, engineering and construction. There are some really exciting opportunities uh, to progress from level seven. So if you enter uh, as a level seven student, you can progress to the BSc honors in building information and modeling management. Now, this is a really exciting new area of uh, development in the AEC disciplines. And there are opportunities for level seven graduates from the school to enter this program here and then to actually in fact to move on to get a master's degree in this area as well. In the Department of Construction, we have got the uh, quantity surveying degree, the construction management degree, and a level seven uh, construction program as well. Moving to the uh, Department of Architecture, we've got uh, architectural technology and interior architecture at uh, level eight and also the joint program between UCC and uh, MTU Cork, the, uh, the degree in architecture. And then we've got level seven uh, architectural technology and interior architecture as well. And just to note that this year, that Lydia Morgan uh, won the Universal Grand Design Challenge Award in Dublin. And uh, Lydia is, is a student of the uh, interior architecture program. Finally, I'm moving on to the National Maritime College of Ireland. And in the National Maritime College of Ireland, we've got the Department of Marine Studies. And that department offers a degree in marine electrotechnology, nautical science, and marine engineering. And I've been asked to highlight the marine electrotechnology uh, degree because there are huge opportunities for graduates. In actual fact, there's a huge shortfall globally and the qualification uh, gained here along with professional qualifications that you would attain along the way allows you to uh, walk anywhere in the world. And as I said, the opportunities are uh, great. So finally, uh, before I close out the slide deck here, uh, there, we have a website called studentawards.ie and that uh, showcases the students who achieved, um, academically achieved awards uh, in 2020 and that's still live so if you want to go on there you can see students how they progress through our programs where they're working now and there's a short bio about uh, the the jobs that they're working in so it's you know a very useful resource for you to review and um, you know you can actually see the students and read about them and so forth so well worthwhile 
uh, taking a look at student awards at IE. So I'll pass you back to Michael now. Thanks, Michael, and thank you all for listening. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, so we have, uh, we'll go straight to the questions. Uh, we have, uh, the first question relates to software development. And the question is about the, the sort of career options after graduation. What sort of career options are available for software developers locally, nationally, internationally? And is there a difference between what's available to those who complete level seven programs versus level eight? I, I think Sean might be best positioned to answer that, Michael. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Uh, so Sean McSweeney here, head of the Department of Computer Science. Um, there's a broad range of options for students. Um, uh, your, obviously your uh, steepest career trajectory is from a level A qualification. Um, with software development, with a software development degree, you would work for your, obviously you could uh, directly move into roles in the large tech companies, Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, and others that you will be aware of. But there's also a large number of roles in other Fortune 500 companies and large um, SMEs within Ireland. So that would be, uh, you know, the likes of Musgraves and others. Um, the development roles can be very broad and it's important that you kind of understand that it's it, you're not necessarily going to be locked in a room as a software developer. That's a kind of a, a very old view of the role. Um, it, it's a very dynamic job. It can be very varied in terms of precisely what you, you do. So it can be all the way from all day long developing code and solving problems to very much a mix of that, developing some code, working with people, understanding their problems and bringing it to a development team. Uh, so the, the opportunities are really very, very good. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Sean. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, these qualifications travel well, Sean, do they, is there any difference between software development in Silicon Valley versus uh, software development in Cork or Kerry? Fortunately, software development is a, uni a universal language, so uh, you could think of it in the olden days of learning Latin. Uh, wherever you travel, uh, C is C code, irrespective of what country you are in and, and where you are native to. Um, so it, there, there's significant opportunity for you to move uh, outside of Cork if for any bizarre reason you might want to leave Cork. Um, but yes, we have graduates that end up in Silicon Valley, that end up in London, uh, uh, and that end up in a broader range of companies other than just the tech companies. Yeah, a uh, follow-on question, Sean, software development, computer systems, uh, the, the major course modules are the ma major categories in which uh, course modules have been designed for those courses. Could you quickly run through that for us? Okay, so there's um, the, the software development uh, level eight and the embedded level seven. So you can think of the level seven as a, you know, a pathway into the level eight are your mainline developer. Okay, so these are the people that would work in large enterprise systems. The computer systems program or the people that would come out of that program are distinctly different in that they would be more your um, uh, data center engineers. So they would be capable of orchestrating machines and the, another critical difference that they would have to the other software development cohort uh, is they will have a number of modules on embedded systems development so they're able to write code to run robotics and autonomous cars and systems similar to that. Okay thank you Sean and um, do the software developers have a different is there a different sort of uh, is it a different mindset to be a software developer rather than somebody who uh, manages computer systems or works in an IT department Sean? Well, uh, it's important that you understand that both uh, tracks have problem solving inside them. Okay, so in, in both sides, you're solving problems. On the IT side, you're solving problems that are primarily to deal with infrastructure and infrastructural integration. Uh, on the software development side, you have a, a more significant um, number of problems and the problems in a lot of cases, in some cases they're equally as different, but in a lot of cases they're more intractable, which means that you need to spend more time sitting down uh, with a pen and paper and figuring out how do I solve this problem. So if you really, really like solving problems, um, software development is the track for you. If you kind of like solving problems and you like interacting with people a little bit more, IT is then the track for you. Uh, thank you, Sean. We'll move on to interior architecture. What uh, jobs are available to you after studying interior architecture? What kind of salary would you get? And is interior design 
included in the interior architecture uh, area. Do we have somebody to take that question? Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Okay, so we're talking about salaries. Um, they will vary uh, depending on if it's a level seven or level eight uh, award. Um, so students with, we find um, professional offices like architectural offices, et, et cetera, that have um, specialisms in interior architecture prefer the level eight graduate, where the graduate of a level seven will quite often go into allied um, disciplines, um, let's say kitchen design, etc. Um, uh, the starting salaries do vary depending on which program you have. Um, and, um, and what was there anything else in that question? I've forgotten. And, and I suppose there was a question in terms of the extent to which uh, interior design is included in the interior architecture area. Okay, so our architecture, interior architecture is the bigger package and then interior design is contained within that. So if you do interior architecture, you can practice interior design. But if you, uh, but well, we don't do it here, but if you had a, an interior design uh, um, qualification, you could not practice interior architecture. So interior architecture is the bigger um, uh, qualification. Okay, and just in terms of the salary, Catherine, I mean, I presumably we, we would we be talking something in the region of 20 to 30,000 euros per annum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, it does, like, so much of this is personal. If you have a really good portfolio coming out of uh, when you graduate, you will be snapped up. So it is quite personal, but I, I think well in that range. Thanks. So, so it's something that uh, if somebody is passionate about it, if they're really keen on it, they believe in it and they're excited by it and they have the talent, then the opportunities are good. Yeah, that's correct. And um, Tim showed one of our students who had placed an award, got an award and our interior architecture, particularly the level, the fourth year students, consistently every year we have three or four of them receiving different IDA awards, et cetera, and the one that Tim showed. So the students that do go into fourth year are very competitive and they tend to be snapped up very fast. Yeah, so thank you, Catherine. Our next thank question you. relates to the mechanical engineering area and the biopharmaceutical engineering uh, area. And, and I suppose uh, the, the question is, well, what are the, uh, what positions are available in that regard? What sort of jobs, uh, how do they pay and what are the nature of the jobs available? So if we have anybody to speak in relation to- Hi, Hi Michael, yeah, I'm, I can talk about the, the mechanical, biomedical um, side of the house. Thank so you, John. The, um, the main jobs are full engineering roles, um, most commonly, I guess, with the large scale multinationals. So the likes of the Strikers, Boston Scientific, um, the Precintes and so on, um, who, are, who are at the cutting edge of, um, let's say, medical device uh, design and development. So there can be design roles or they can, there can be R&D roles within the different organizations. And that would be particularly true for, let's say, the level eight stroke level nine graduates. The level seven graduates tend to be more hands-on. So a lot of those um, industries, they are very highly technical. They have very expensive machinery and equipment uh, to machine out and produce um, hip joints, knee joints, all these kind of things. And they require the more people with hands-on expertise to be able to, I suppose, manage those to keep them operating within specification. So there's there's a huge variety of, of different roles. Um, mechanical engineers generally can go into, um, I suppose, almost any industry. It's a very broad degree. Uh, covers electrical engineering, design, innovation, entrepreneurship. Some companies, or some students will set up their own companies and businesses afterwards, but they can work in places like the ESB or in the pharma biotech sector, uh, looking at all the, um, the vessels and the processes um, that are happening there. 
Salaries are very attractive at the minute. Um, 30, 40,000 is, is not unheard of. And there's a huge demand at the minute for, for those types of graduates. Uh, Gerard, while I have you there, um, the, uh, the, there's a question here in relation to the difference between engineering degrees offered in MTU versus our near neighbours UCC and elsewhere, and whether employers have a preference for one type or the other, or maybe they like to choose a mix of graduates from the different institutions. Um, they, <laughs> obviously, they, they prefer the MTU graduates. Um, <laughs> That goes without saying, but no, uh, I suppose there is a difference between them fundamentally. Um, the, the, the MTU graduates will get a certain element of hands-on experience. They will do a lot of teamwork um, and they will, they will work together looking at in the area of entrepreneurship and innovation. And I think that is one of the unique features of the MTU graduates. So lots of teamwork, lots of project work and exposure to the practical side as well, which the industries do like. Um, I'm probably not that qualified to speak on our near neighbor, but I don't think they have the range of practical facilities uh, that we have. Um, the, the companies will take both. You know, no company wants 100 engineers from MTU to rock in on in, in one particular day. They will want a mix of graduates uh, who come from level seven, from level eight, from different facilities, somewhat international experience. So um, there is a difference, but um, they are, I suppose, to be cherished and um, um, and to be appreciated. But the MTU um, is definitely better. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, no bias in that response. Uh, None at all. Um, in I have one last question for you, Ger. The BNG honours in biomedical engineering. There's a word or two missing in the question, but what I'm assuming the, the question relates to is uh, scholarships yeah. and uh, when people apply for those scholarships. I, I think here what we have is a student who will be sitting uh, exams in, in June coming. And when does the first opportunity become available for that student to apply for uh, a scholarship? I'm glad you asked me that question, Michael, um, because the scholarships have actually only just opened um, for application and they're open for application until roughly the middle of March. So the, the students will apply for the scholarship. There's an online uh, application form uh, on, on our website and the students apply on, online and we hold interviews typically in around May again, typically before the leaving cert exams. And the, the successful applicant, it's, it's a combination of their leaving cert scores or points and the interviews. So the, it's, op it will, it's open now and it will be open until around the middle of March. So it, students don't have to wait until the leaving cert results come out. Um, they can apply right now or for the next couple of weeks. Hey, thanks, Gerard, greatly appreciate that, thank you. Uh, moving on to the maritime area, um, uh, when it comes to finding work placement, do students have to find their own work placement or does the college uh, secure that for the students? We have somebody from the National Maritime College of Ireland on. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I can, I can take that one. Um, so basically, the way it works is um, when students come to NMCI and um, for the nautical science students who go to sea in at the end of their first full year in the college, so the summer after they, they start, um, they will spend a lot of the first year um, basically being strongly supported to um, secure their, 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 their placement on ships at sea. Um, we have a, a, a dedicated office that, that undertakes that role and provides the support to the students. And the way it generally works is the shipping companies will come in um, in the rundown to, to Christmas or early in the new year in January, around this time of year, in fact. And they will basically, you know, present to the students and explain to them uh, what's involved and what their particular company does and where they operate in the world, the kinds of ships they, 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 they operate and so on. And then basically there's a series of interviews take place then in, in, in the weeks after that. And MTU provides very significant support to students 
in terms of CV preparation and interview preparation and everything else. And then basically um, oh, between the period from sort of, you know, February through to about May, the shipping companies basically offer places then to, to many of the cadets. And um, the, the, we, we end up always in a situation where we have we have two categories. We have those cadets who secure what are called cadetships. So they will basically then do all of their training with a, a particular company. And part of that process generally is at the end of it, then they will work for that company on the completion of their cadetship. And that works on the completion of their, their degree at, at MTU. Um, and the other category then are cadets who, who basically will work with a variety of companies over the course of their cadetship and their time at NMCI. And at the end of that, then they're they're free to go and work for whatever companies you know they they might wish to. So there are two different models. It depends on the on 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 the students and 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 their wishes and and indeed what the shipping companies are looking for at any given point in time. But basically, in general, you know we 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 work with the students to find the placements. So it's it's not as if the students are kind of left there on their own to to figure it out. There's very yeah. support there. Uh, thank you, Cormac. Uh, two additional questions for you, Cormac. Um... In relation to the medical or eyesight tests, uh, if, if uh, students have difficulties in these areas, does that prevent them being admitted to course at the NMCI? That's the first one. And the second question then is, uh, are all the classes held in the National Maritime College of Ireland uh, facility in Ring of Skiddy, or is there some, are, are there some classes held in the Bishopstone campus as well? Okay, so taking the first question first. So um, basically the medical and the eyesight requirements are laid down based under international law. So obviously the 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 you know the the qualification that that, that NMCI students secure is, if you will, it's the equivalent, for example, of, of being a commercial airline pilot. So as a result of that, you know, the job that 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 our graduates do at sea um, you know, involves um, very particular um, roles and requirements and so on and and you know there are there, there are consequently very strict international rules around it so generally yes the 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 well without exception unfortunately the requirements are you must pass you must meet the medical requirements you must meet the eyesight tests and what we always say to to prospective students who are interested if you have any questions if you have any doubts about that please go and check early. So it's worth, you know, the, 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 the eyesight and medical requirements, we can provide you with that information. Um, but basically, if you have a doubt, if you have a question in your head, it's best to check it out early because, you know, the requirements are strict. Um, in relation to the second question, yes, in general, um, you know, the, virtually all of the, the, the course delivery is done in NMCI, but there is very significant interaction um, with Bishopstown and indeed with other campuses in terms of student activities so, you know, whether it's clubs, societies, all that kind of thing. So, you know, um, 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 NMCI students are, are students of MTU and therefore they have all of the supports. They have all of the, the you know, the social outlets and everything else that are available to students um, um, elsewhere across the university. So, you know, you will find yourself in Bishopstown and in Crawford and in the School of Music and whatever, but mostly for the enjoyable parts of, of being in college. So, um, but there's definitely the flow there, but your, your course delivery is predominantly um, down in, in, in NMCI. Yeah, a final one for you, uh, Cormac, I suppose uh, it relates to if uh, somebody completes a course in the NMCI, will they spend the rest of their career at sea or will they have uh, opportunities uh, uh, that aren't on the sea, that are on land? Or someplace it, it, it's a great question, Michael, and the answer is it's entirely up to you. So um, the pattern, really, there, there's two patterns there. So traditionally, if you go back far enough, that was the fate of the professional seafarer. You would qualify and you were spending the rest of your, your life at sea. That's no longer the case unless you want it to be. Um, so th there's two ways to look at it. And um, for a number of our graduates, and because the career is, is so rewarding, because working at sea is such an interesting job, many of them choose to remain as working seafarers. One of my closest friends, um, uh, and I'm getting a bit long in the tooth now, he's still at sea because he loves it. It gives him a huge quality of life. And um, he is a ship's captain. He is extraordinarily well paid for it. He will retire early as a result. He gets to live where he wishes um, because basically when he's home, he's home. And so on. So, you know, for a lot of people, that's the choice that they make, but it is very much a choice for a lot of our graduates today as well. They 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 see uh, they, they 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 approach the seafaring, the, the, the seagoing part simply as the first step, the first stage of a career. Um, and very, very often nowadays, it's, it's what I did. And um, they will spend, you know, including their four years of training, perhaps somewhere between seven 
to 10 to 12 years at sea. Um, in my case, it was about 10 years. Um, and then they move into to a whole bewildering array of, 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 of career paths after that. Technology, regulation, search and rescue, supply chain, ports, finance, legal, the list is very, very long. Um, I ended up in information technology, um, but always with a sort of a maritime angle. I ended up in research and ultimately I ended up in, in, in education. So um, there are huge options and opportunities for people who go to sea. By no means is, is you know, is a, a, a choice of a course at NMCI a choice to spend the rest of your life at sea. Not at all. If you want it to be, it is, um, but that's your choice. There are wonderful career choices open to people once they, once they, once they graduate from NMCI. All right, thank you, Cormac. The next question we have is on common entry uh, engineering. And what are the advantages of choosing the common entry option versus choosing a specific engineering course? Do we have somebody to take that question? Hi, Michael. Yeah. Um, Hi, Des. Hi, Michael. Des Walsh here, Head of Civil Structural Environmental Engineering. So, yeah, I suppose the common engineering entry um, keeps the choice for the student open for a further year. Um, the students do the common year and then go into second year of mechanical, biomedical, uh, chemical and biopharmaceutical, uh, structural or sustainable energy engineering. Um, the entry requirements uh, to the common en engineering year uh, would be a H6 in, in mathematics or um, an O1 in mathematics. Um, traditionally, entry, for example, to the mechanical or structural program would, would look for a H4 in mathematics, but the, the common engineering entry will, will take down to a H6 and, and indeed an O1. And we put in the additional mathematics that are relevant to uh, engineering studies, I suppose, in the first year of the program, so that uh, by the time the student joins the second year of their discipline of choice, they have, they have been uh, brought up to, to the relevant um, standard. So it is a, it is a challenging year. Uh, if you have a H5 or a H6, you, you need to be prepared to, to work at it. But our experience is that if you have um, the right work attitude and you have either physics or chemistry done as a leaving cert subject, you will succeed. Um, the students we find who really struggle and who really have to work hard to get into the second year of the programs are those who might have a H5 or a H6 in mathematics and who haven't done chemistry or physics, one of those two. Those students in particular need to be, uh, they need to have a, a good strong work ethic and a determination to, to get through. So, you know, the common entry in that respect is a, a, a second chance in terms of the mathematics. Um, it keeps your options open for a further year um, and it is a, an alternative uh, route for you into each of the five programs that I've mentioned. Uh, I'll keep you on the line, Des, while I have you. In relation to uh, a student choosing between common entry, structural, civil or environmental, um, why might a, a student choose? I suppose you've covered the common entry. If we take structural, civil and environmental, why might a student choose to, to, to enter one or other of those courses? Yeah, well, I suppose the, the civil program and the environmental program, which we offer, are, are both level seven programs. So they're three year ordinary degree programs. The uh, structural engineering is a, a level eight honors degree program, which requires the H4 in mathematics, um, or someone can enter second year there via the common entry. The structural engineering program, um, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, it's, it's civil and structural. There's quite a lot of civil engineering uh, modules in there, but we have an extra emphasis on, on structures, on structural analysis, on structural design. Um, but we, the, the course does cover the fundamentals of civil engineering as well. That's water, wastewater, um, management, health and safety, all of those kind of topics. So, um, in a nutshell, the, our, our civil and environmental programs are three-year level seven programs. At the end of the three years, you can cross into the level eight program and progress to the level eight program. And as be, has been mentioned earlier by, by Tim um, in his talks, at the end of third year in the level eight of structural engineering, you have a choice to uh, do the fourth year and graduate with your level eight degree, or you can uh, 
transfer to a, a two-year integrated master's, a further two years of study to get your master's in either structural engineering or alternatively civil engineering, environment and energy. So there's plenty of paths there and plenty of opportunities um, for your particular preference. Um, one, once you get to start to, to study in the area, you'll know pretty quickly what it is that, that you particularly like to study and, and whether you want to be a, a person who works um, in a more management and contracting type role or whether you want to work in a consultants and in a design office. And there are plenty of opportunities to, to specialize and focus on the areas that you find uh, are, are to your particular liking. Thank you, Des. And I'm going to move on to construction management and the question raised here, the difference between, what's the difference between construction management and quantity surveying? And what's the difference between both of those areas and engineering? So I'm not sure if we have somebody to take that question. Um, it, it, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Are you there, Daniel? Thank you. I'm here, yeah. I, I can kind of pick up on the um, the, the construction management and quantity surveying. Um, the basic way to think about um, is, is the construction management um, is organizing and coordinating and managing the process of erecting the building, of, of bringing all the components and the people that, who will undertake that work, I mean, into the, the, in the right places at the right time. Um, very, very complex task um, and a lot of um, creative and problem solving abilities required for that. The quantity surveyors, on the other hand, um, are look, look after the, the finances. So they look after, um, they establish um, maybe an estimate, I mean, in the initial stages when a client is looking to undertake a project um, and then develop up that estimate into a, a very um, strong calculation of what the building should cost. And, and then obviously they manage the, the finances on, a, on an ongoing basis throughout the project. Um, there are um, opportunities to work on either the client side in professional practice office, offices or working on, on the contracting side um, where, where you, 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 you're, you're looking after the, the, oper the, the, the running costs you know, of, of the building operations. Um, regarding, uh, what was this, the second question, Michael, the, the second part? Uh, really, it was the difference, I think, between the uh, quantity surveying construction management career and a career in engineering and civil structural, that sort of... Uh, um, well, that does um, refer to, in, in, the, in the, the civil engineering and structural engineering sites, probably primarily on the design side, although they sort of, there's a sort of crossover into the, the sort of management of projects. Uh, I guess that the civil and structural engineers might be more involved in heavy engineering type of projects like the build the bridges, maybe roads, uh, construction managers who might be more involved in commercial retail housing developments, but also, you know, there's a crossover between the two. Um, so so you, you'd find, you could find a, a construction management graduate like, I mean, from our programs working alongside or with, or instead of engineers, like, I mean, managing, managing the projects. Um, Quant surveyors, um, I, civil engineers mightn't have the, the level of the financial knowledge, I mean, to, to manage. But what's happening, I think there's a, there's a blurring of roles, I mean, in, in the industry in general. Um, clients don't want to see the technical disciplines. They just want to see their, their building constructed or their infrastructure um, completed. Um, so, you know, if, if, the, if the capability is there, and I think a lot of our graduates would have all of these capabilities um, to cross over and migrate into the different areas um, that, that they could undertake um, a lot of these roles. Um, they get a good broad understanding to start off with and then they specialize, um, particularly in our, in our two programs. Um, so you could have, in theory, a quantity of let me could end up being a project manager of, of a construction project or the overall development. Likewise, I mean, a construction manager, somebody with a construction management degree might end up having some part of, of managing the finances of, of a project. Um, I don't think we'd, we'd end up into the, the structural side. Uh, that might be a bit scary. I mean, I think we'll leave that to the structural engineers. Uh, thank, thank you, Daniel. Michael. Thank you, Daniel. Our next question is for biological sciences, common entry. Why should somebody choose common entry versus one of the other options? Do we have somebody to take that question? Hi, Michael. Leslie here. How are you? 
Leslie, how are you doing? Your, your video I feel needs. like I feel like I'm on the Eurovision. <laughs> um, so, um, with regard to the common entry, it's a bit similar to the common common entry engineering. Um, I suppose for the um, student who doesn't really know what they would like to do, has a keen interest in science, um, and particularly in the biological sciences area. This um, keeps their options open, um, so they would enter and complete, I suppose, um, two years where they would be doing general science and getting a flavour of the other um, disciplines that they might eventually specialize in like the pharmaceutical or the nutrition or whatever other discipline they might like to progress through so the common entry is a really good um i suppose i suppose opportunity to keep your options open and to um you know to, but to make that commitment to the biological sciences as well in the same way yeah uh, what are the uh, work placement options there uh, yeah, um, the work placement uh, depends on the program that you do, but I suppose the minimum is a 16 week work placement in year three of um, of the programs in the pharmaceutical biotech program, the nutrition program um, and the uh, agribiosciences is a full semester um, in, in placement as well. And with the biomedical science, it's a postgraduate um, special purpose award and it's a full year in placement in a, in a hospital. So all of the programs have an integrated placement in them, integrated or postgrad placement in them. Yeah, okay, thank you. We have a question in relation to physical sciences. Uh, is there a major difference between choosing physical sciences common entry at level eight versus physical sciences common entry at level seven? Hi, Michael. Um, Donna. So, uh, good question there. Hi, everyone. Um, the level seven and the level eight common entry options. Uh, what it really the, the, the real difference there is your exit route after year three. If you choose the level seven option, you have the, the option then to step off after year three with a BSc ordinary uh, award in either the instrumentation program, which we applied physics and instrumentation, or if you move more towards the analytical chemistry side, you're stepping off with uh, BSc in uh, analytical chemistry. Um, analytical and pharmaceutical chemistry. So it does give you that option to step out after year three. And at the moment, there certainly have been opportunities for graduates who uh, just do the ordinary level degree. They want to step out into industry after three years and often they may come back then afterwards to complete the honors degree in one year as um, either as a full-time student or they can come back part-time to, to complete it. So I guess it gives you a little bit more flexibility, but it depends on whether you want to dedicate the three or the four years. Thank you very much, Donna. Uh, question here in terms of the difference between uh, electrical engineering and electronic engineering. Do you have anybody to pick up on that? Hi, oh, Michael. Martin Hill here from Electrical and Electronic. Thank you, Martin. Um, essentially, it's the most common question we get asked. And uh, for us, they're very closely related. It really relates just to the scale of what you're doing. So there's a very different, so electrical engineering deals with power distribution, either from wind turbines across the country or within a factory plant, uh, but everything related to have reasonably high power. Uh, and then electronic engineering has to do with computing, mobile phones, internet, designing circuits at the low power level. So it's, they, they, have, they have different considerations, I guess, that uh, your mobile phone is unlikely to explode, but a power plant might. Yeah, so one is big, Martin. It's to do with lots of power transmission generation. And the other is much more to do with uh, uh, smart devices, electronic control boards, and so on. Like. Yeah, and 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 in the future they're getting they're getting closer and closer together. We're we're managing our energy more and more with the smart devices, so the two are getting closer together. But so so the the, the platform on which they build is the same, but then at the later stages you're 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 deciding whether or not you're controlling a grid, or you're controlling a an autonomous vehicle or a mobile phone. So it's the, it's the same fundamental uh, technology, but applied slightly differently. And I guess our electronics people probably do more coding because those devices that they make all tend to be pretty smart enough and all have code inside them. Thanks very much, Martin. I think that's going to bring us to a conclusion on the engineering and science side. Time is a little against us. The questions are raining in and being addressed very quickly on chat. So. 
We'll encourage people to keep entering their questions uh, there. Uh, coming through on the poll at the moment, we've asked what's your primary purpose in applying to MTU. Six out of 10 are focused on getting the qualification from the undergraduate course and going to employment. Two out of 10 are interested in research, one out of 10 in starting your own company and one out of 10 in looking at other uh, opportunities. So uh, really interesting replies coming through there. Our next presentation, we're gonna move on now to a presentation piece is gonna come from Ruth Murphy. And Ruth is going to speak to us on the DARE scheme. So Ruth, as soon as you're ready to go there, um, we'll ask you to uh, share the screen and take over. Thanks, Michael. Um, hi, everybody. I'm just going to start the uh, presentation there. Hopefully everybody can see it. Is that coming up, Michael? Absolutely, Ruth. Thank you very Great, much. Great, thanks. Um, sorry, I'm just having a problem starting the... Okay, there we go. Um, so my name is Ruth Murphy and I'm the Acting Disability Support Officer here in the Disability Support Service in MTU Cork. And I'm just going to talk briefly around the, the DARE scheme. So DARE is the Disability Access Route to Education and it is an admission scheme for school leavers who dis whose disability has had a negative impact on their second level education. So what this means is that MTU Cork has a 5% quota or a number of reduced points places in all courses for uh, reduced points. Sorry, I'm just going to change the slides there. Um, so what this means is that unfortunately there isn't a guarantee of an offer or an automatic reduction of points um, as there are usually a lot more applicants than there are places, but we did make over, over 70 reduced points offers last year. And we're not the only ones as part of DARE. A large number of colleges and universities around the country are part of DARE and here that you're going to hear about in a, in a little while. And you only need to make one application to be considered for all of these colleges. But please make sure to check their websites for how they make their offers. So we consider applicants within 50 points of the cutoff point of the course they're applying to. And you also need to make sure that you meet the minimum entry requirements of the course that you are applying to. We also offer priority places to students with physical disabilities, visual and hearing impairments, and here offer priority places to students who are DARE and HEAR eligible. So we'd encourage you to please check our webpage at www.cit.ie forward slash DARE for more information on our offers process. So should I apply to DARE? So you should apply to DARE if you feel like your learning difference, health condition or disability has had some impact on your educational performance in school and you may not meet the points for your preferred course. You also need to be under 23 years of age from the 1st of January 2021. Otherwise, you can apply as a mature student. We recommend downloading the DARE handbook and looking at the Access College website for more detailed information. So DARE considers applicants under a wide category, wide range of categories, and there are criteria that apply to each one. So you need to check the information on the Access College website for the category you're applying under. So some students may have one more than one diagnosis, and you can declare these on your DARE application, but you, can, you only need to be eligible under one category to be eligible for DARE. Please note that there were some changes announced this week around the um, the dare um, the specific learning difficulty. So that includes dyslexia and dyscalculia. And DARE have recognised the difficulties that are happening at the moment with the current lockdown, where some students and schools are having difficulties getting this information. So DARE will now accept for this year older educational psychologist reports and scores that your school may have done, for, for example, for your junior cert exam supports, um, dated from after the 1st of February 2016 onwards, rather than the 1st of February 2019. So again, that update is on the DARE website. So to apply to DARE, the first thing you must do is apply to the CEO by the 1st of February 
2021. And on your online CEO application, you can declare your disability, which then brings you to Section A or the Supplementary Information Form online. And you need to complete this um, by the 1st of March. And it's very important in this section to opt into DARE. So that's question one on the Supplementary Information Form. Do you wish to be considered for DARE? And again, you need to do this by the 1st of March because this section closes um, on your CEO application by afterwards. Section B, the educational impact statement, can be downloaded and completed by your school. And there has also been a change announced this week that DARE will accept electronic signatures and stamps. Again, the information is on the Access College website and being communicated to the guidance counsellors in school as well. Section C, the evidence of disability relates to your documents which state a clear diagnosis and the impact. You can submit uh, an existing report or you can get the Section C form from the DARE website and get this completed by the relevant professional. So both Section B, the school report and the evidence of disability or Section C need to be posted to the CEO in Galway by the 15th of March. You need to send good quality copies of your documents and keep proof of postage. Currently, the deadlines for applying to DARE and HERE are not changing. And if you cannot make any of this, these deadlines or if you miss them, you need to use the appeal system available and more details again are on the Access College website. So to be to, in order to be eligible for DARE, you need to meet the criteria for both educational impact and the evidence of disability. And as I mentioned earlier, each category of disability has its own criteria, criteria that you will need to check. If you think you might not be eligible, so for example, not all students with dyslexia, for example, would be eligible for DARE depending on the scores, the literacy scores they may have, we'd really encourage you to declare yourself on the CEO application anyway. So this is confidential and it means the disability support service in the colleges that you're, uh, you're applying to are aware of you. And if you get an offer from them, they can contact you for supports. And this means you can still access supports. It doesn't mean even if you're not eligible for DARE, you can still get supports from the Disability Support Service. So the timeline, so we've already talked about the, the deadlines that are coming up quite soon. What happens once you've submitted all the information for your DARE application is you won't hear whether you're eligible or not until late June. What DARE wait, the DARE waits until you are, um, you've basically finished the Leaving Cert ex exams before you're notified. And that comes through by email that you've used for your CEO application and also the correspondence section in your CEO application. Um, if you are not eligible for DARE, as I mentioned, you can still get disability supports in college. And if you are eligible, then you will be considered for a reduced points place if needed for round one in um, offers in mid-August. And we also, so the Disability Support Service would run an early orientation for new students and we'd have a wide range of supports available. So that would run in late August or early September. And I'd recommend checking out our student guide and videos on our website. So for more information, um, again, we keep saying there's a lot of information on the Access College website. Also, there's a lot of information specifically around how we make offers, how many places are available in each course on the DARE CIT, uh, well, what was CIT, but um, we'll be updating the, the, the links um, over, the, over the year. Um, but I'd encourage you to, to look at that more. Um, this is a very, very short presentation. We have a much bigger, it's an hour long presentation up on our, our DARE webpage as well, which should talk you through each section in a lot more detail that I'd recommend to, um, looking at. And if you're interested in um, finding out more information about the DSS supports, again, go to our website. Um, I'd really recommend looking at our guide, our student guide, as well as the videos that are there. And um, again, if you have any uh, confidential or very individual queries, please feel free. Um, we are working remotely at the moment, so you can email your query to dare at cit.ie. And um, please, we'll come back to you quite quickly around that. And we do treat those, those emails confidentially. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth, for a great presentation there. Uh, we'll now move on to the 
uh, uh, here scheme and Elaine Dennehy, if Elaine is present, we'll ask Elaine to uh, to share her screen. Thank you, Ruth. Mike. Thanks, Michael. So good afternoon, my name is Elaine Dennehy. I work in the Access Service and I'm joined by my colleague Louise O'Callaghan who will be answering your questions in the Q&A box. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of the HEAR scheme. The HEAR scheme, so Higher Education Access Route is an admissions route for school leavers who for social, financial or cultural reasons are underrepresented, underrepresented in higher education. The scheme was set up to ensure that all Leaving Cert students have an equal opportunity to progress to higher education. So why would you apply to HERE? The main benefits of applying to the HERE scheme include the potential opportunity to receive reduced points offers through the CAO in the participating colleges provided you meet the minimum entry requirements. Full details on how MTU Cork offers reduced points places is available at www.cit.ie forward slash here. For details on minimum entry requirements, please download the handbook from the participating college you wish to attend and make sure that you check the requirements for all of the courses that you wish to study as they can vary. Post entry supports are another benefit of the HERE scheme. In MTU Cork, all HERE eligible students who accept their place are offered financial support in the form of a HERE bursary, one to one meetings with the HERE coordinator, academic, social, and personal support. When deciding whether or not to apply for the HERE scheme, it's important to ask a number of questions first. So you must answer yes to this first question. Was your household income on or below 45,790 in 2019? You must speak to your parent or your guardian when you're making the HERE application, as you may not have all the information that you need to make the application. And we would highly recommend that you download the handbook before you start completing the application. So to, to determine which other eligibility criteria you may meet, you should ask the following questions. Do you or your family have a medical card or GP visit card in date as of the 31st of December 2020? Did your parents guardians receive a means tested social welfare payment for at least 26 weeks in 2019? Is your parents or guardians employment status underrepresented in higher education? Research suggests that some social class groups are underrepresented in higher education and the list of these groups is available from the HERE handbook or on www.accesscollege.com College.ie. Have you attended a DESH second level school for five years? If you're not sure if your school is on the DESH list, you could ask your school. Um, do you live in an area of concentrated disadvantage? And you can use maps.pubble.ie to determine the deprivation score for the area you live in using either your postcode or your address. It's important to note that you must meet the here income limit plus the right combination of two other indicators to be deemed here eligible and full details of the here eligibility criteria are available in the here handbook or on accesscollege.ie. So when you complete the online HERE application through the CAO application, a checklist of documents that you need to submit to the CAO will appear at the end of the document, at the end of that application. So the documents that are required will be determined by what information you include in your application. Income documents for 2019 will be required and depending on the type of income into the household, you may be asked to submit a statement of liability, which was formerly a P21 and you can obtain that from the revenue.ie website. A notice of assessment chapter four for people who are self-employed and our social welfare form or statement. This form is actually in the back of the HERE handbook or you can download it and print it from the Access College website and present it at your local social welfare office to be sign signed and stamped. So make sure that you submit all pages of every document that you're asked to require. You need to send these by post to the CAO and you should only send the copies so you should retain the originals. And we would always recommend that you get certificate of postage when you're sending anything to the CAO. For children in the care of the state, a letter from TUSLA will be required. 
So here in DARE, you can apply to here and DARE, and you could potentially be eligible for here and DARE. And as Ruth already said, and these here and DARE eligible students would be prioritized. Um, so the timeline is the same. The deadlines are the same. So in the first instance, you must make a CAO application by the 1st of February. The here closing date for the online application, the opt in is the 1st of March 2021. And the supporting documentation, which you, you will be required to submit by post, must be received by the CAO by the 15th of March 2021. Notice of eligibility again will be late June and review and appeals can take place up to the middle of July and the here dare offers again are made through the CAO uh, from round one and all here eligible students are expected to attend the college orientation in late August, early September. So please contact us if you have any questions about the application process or the post entry supports. This is a really short presentation um, and I hope that you have received enough information and are directed to the correct websites so that you can make your decision about whether or not you meet those eligibility criteria. So the most important websites to visit would be accesscollege.ie forward slash here, cit.ie forward slash here. Uh, for a full list of the courses available in MTU, go to mtu.ie and also follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Elaine. Yeah, thanks indeed. So uh, now we've come to the end of uh, today's uh, event. Uh, what uh, we, if you, if you wish to get additional questions answered in relation to here or there, email dare at cit.ie or email here at cit.ie and both will get you straight through. Um, uh, we've answered, I think, the vast bulk of the questions that have been posed. We will uh, uh, take those answers and we'll post them on the MTU website. So in the event that uh, any question hasn't been fully addressed today, we'll make sure that there, there's an answer posted on the MTU website in uh, due course. In addition, for anybody who's uh, participating on this webinar, who wants one-to-one -one guidance in relation to CAO, they can email us at cao at cit.ie. We set up an appointment and we'll be delighted to uh, engage with you. So on that note, sincere thanks to all our contributors. Thanks to everybody who uh, joined us. We hope you found the event useful. Best of luck with the CAO process and hopefully we'll see you in uh, MTU soon. Take care, bye-bye.